And as you're taking your seat, take up your Bibles and turn in them to Daniel chapter 9, if you will. And we're coming to this, well, I would say every chapter in Daniel is fantastic and monumental. This one's really good. In fact, the end of Daniel chapter 9 is the great prophecy of the 70 weeks, the 77s. A prophecy on which much of the rest of the Bible hangs. And it will be good for us to be in this chapter. But before we get to Daniel 77s, we come to what is perhaps the profoundest prayer in all of Scripture. And it is profound, not just for its words, not just for its posture and disposition, its tone, not just for its content, but also where it is historically situated. And we stand to gain much this evening from looking at this great prayer. We'll be in Daniel's prayer for several weeks um, Josh Kelso preached on this as an independent message a number of year ago, years ago from the pulpit. I would encourage you to listen to Josh's exposition of this prayer. It is simply excellent. We find ourselves in Daniel 9, not because we need to redo Josh's sermon. Uh, that could not be done. But simply because it is the next set of verses in our exposition of Daniel. Have you ever felt constrained to pray? I must go to the Lord. I want you to think for a moment about the situations that, felt, that caused you to feel constrained to pray. You know, the kind of prayer that it just emerges out of an undistracted devotion to the Lord and an acute sense of need. What have you felt most pressed to take to God? What situations, what concerns have pushed you into prayer of a desperate nature? There are those foxhole prayers, the kind that say something like, God, if you just get me out of this mess, I promise you I will. But there are certainly times in the Christian life where we feel our need more acutely than at others. Prayer is a discipline of the life of faith. It is essentially the language of crying out to God for help. It is the expression of dependence. I don't have what it takes. I need God. And how gracious is our God to invite us into personal relationship to him where we can ask such things. Pour out our hearts before him. Entreat him for help. Go to him in a time of need. And prayer is that fundamental discipline of a life of faith that we constrain ourselves to go to the Lord regularly. Daniel has already proven himself to be such a man, a man of prayer, even when it was costly. Essentially would cost him his life had not God rescued him. But here in Daniel chapter 9, we have something beyond the realm of disciplined prayer life. We have something of a prayer of desperation, the kind of prayer that comes out of a recognition of a deep need, the prayer of dire straits. And I want to begin our time this evening by reading Daniel's prayer. We'll pick up the prayer in Daniel 9, 4. I prayed to Yahweh my God and confessed and said... Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame as it is to this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which you have driven them, because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. 
So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of Yahweh our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore Yahweh has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us, for Yahweh our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake, O my God. Do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. As the Babylonian exile neared its end, Daniel prayed. This evening, we're looking at just the introduction to Daniel's prayer, the first three verses. We'll look at three elements of Daniel's prayer here. And the main point is that the Babylonian exile is coming to an end, and Daniel knows it, and Daniel prays. Let's look first at the occasion of Daniel's prayer. This is found in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans... This is the occasion, the the setting, the timing of Daniel's prayer. This is the first year of Darius. That is, it's the first year of the Medo-Persian Empire. You remember Belshazzar's party. He was hosting a party with all of his nobles, and they were drinking out of the golden goblets from the temple in Jerusalem that were devoted to Yahweh, and they were toasting to their gods. And the handwriting appeared on the wall. This was the end of the Babylonian Empire. That very night, 539 B.C., Cyrus's engineers, having stopped up the Euphrates River, upstream of the city, they had lowered the water level just enough that the elite soldiers could sneak into Babylon under the gate. During Belshazzar's party, they killed the king, they took over the city, and they secured for themselves the once mighty Babylonian Empire. It now was the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And the Persian king Cyrus set up Darius the Mede, probably the historical figure Gubaru, as regent over the Babylonian district. And the Judean captives who were there came under new management. A change of empires would be an upsetting series of events. It would create doubt and political uncertainty. Would Darius the Mede favor the Jews? Would Cyrus the Persian Be nice to them. Perhaps political upheavals at times have focused your prayer life. This certainly was a time to be concerned about geopolitics. It would be a time to be concerned about the fate of Israel and the exiles there in Babylonian captivity. We move from the occasion of Daniel's prayer to the ground of Daniel's prayer in verse 2. Notice what Daniel says. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. What do we find here? The fulfillment of the desolations. The desolations here, plural, probably referring to the intensity of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian Empire. 
the, the fulfillment of God's leaving Jerusalem and the surrounding regions desolate for some time meant that there was going to be a limit to God's discipline of his people. And we see that from time to time. Uh, if God had not made the great tribulation as short as it is, perhaps not even the elect would survive it, he says. In this case, the limitation would be to 70 years of desolations. I can't help but notice here in Daniel 9 too, a, a, a little theology of bibliology. Right? What, what is our Bible? How are we to understand it? Notice the wording here. This is the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah. That's interesting. Daniel is reading Jeremiah. He's reading the books that contain the, the prophecies of Jeremiah. And it is called here the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah. We have here in this text dual authorship. That is, there's a little a author of Jeremiah's prophecies, that would be Jeremiah, and there's a capital A author of these prophecies, and that would be the God of the universe, communicating infallibly through a human instrument. This is how the scriptures are written. Divine authorship and human authorship. And God doesn't make mistakes. He is able to use a fallible instrument to communicate clearly an infallible message. And just because a human author is involved doesn't mean that human errors creep in. God superintends so that it is infallible. And here, this infallible word comes through what is a contemporary of Daniel. Jeremiah and Daniel lived at the same time. And what you have in this text is an immediate recognition on Daniel's part that God has indeed spoken through Jeremiah. They were contemporaries. This sort of reminds us of Peter and Paul. 2 Peter 3.15 and 16, you may be familiar. Peter is talking about Paul's writings, and he calls them scripture. He says that some people don't understand Paul, and they twist his words just like they twist the rest of the scriptures. There, Peter, a contemporary of Paul, is recognizing that Paul, as he is writing scripture, is communicating the very words of God. God is superintending human authors so that they write and compose without error his very words. Peter recognized that. Peter recognized that in Paul in his day, and Daniel recognizes that in Jeremiah's writings in his own day. And notice that this is an immediate recognition. It doesn't come centuries later by some church committee deciding after the fact what was to be considered God's word. No, it's God's word as soon as it is penned. And it is up to God's people to recognize it. Daniel recognized it in Jeremiah's words. And Daniel has in mind particular prophecies that Jeremiah gave. I want to turn your attention to Jeremiah 25. In Jeremiah 25, we get this introduction in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Uh, what is the word that comes to Jeremiah in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon? Look down at verse 9. Behold... I will send and take all the families of the north, declares Yahweh, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be, when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares Yahweh, for their iniquity." So God says that the nation of Babylon will be his servant to accomplish his judgment against Israel. And in being his servant, Babylon would be sinning and would therefore be judged for sinning against God's people for his own motives. Nebuchadnezzar was not bent on keeping Israel faithful to Yahweh. He was not seeking the glory of the Lord in being God's instrument. He was just God's instrument doing whatever he was doing, sinning. And God is using a sinful empire to accomplish his good purpose. It's not the first time Yahweh has done that. It's not the last time he would do that. 
Turn to Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10. For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. This is a very specific prophecy that after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, God would bring Israel back to the land. God would fulfill his good purposes for them. He is Yahweh and he knew his good purposes and he made this promise. So this is a promise of 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now Daniel was taken in the first deportation in 605 BC. And you may remember there were three deportations, 605 BC, 597 BC, and 586 BC. The third deportation in 586 BC coincided with the destruction of of Jerusalem itself in the final siege. Now 605 minus 70, and again, we're in BC years, we're counting down to zero, right? So we subtract years to get the, the difference. 605 minus 70 puts us around five, in the mid 530s BC. That would be 70 years. Uh, if you track it from the second deportation, 597, that takes you down to 527-ish. And if you start at 586 B.C., the third deportation and the destruction of Jerusalem, you subtract 70, you end up at 516 B.C., which is when the rebuilt temple was dedicated. And so scholars have uh, tried to figure out, okay, which 70 years is in mind? We know how long this is going to be. We don't necessarily know the starting point. Daniel may not have known when God started the countdown either. But he was taken captive in 605 B.C. It has therefore been 66 to 67 years. He is now 81 to 82 years old. And Daniel is thinking the time must be close. The time must be close. It's interesting in Daniel chapter 9, the divine name Yahweh, God's personal name, the the name he gave to Israel that reminded them of his covenant-keeping nature. Yahweh, that name shows up nine time, or seven times in Daniel chapter 9. It doesn't show up anywhere else in the book of Daniel. That's interesting because Daniel here is appealing to the very nature and the promises of God in making this prayer. But of course, this promise of God goes back farther than Jeremiah 25 and 29. I want to turn your attention to 1 Kings chapter 8. Go ahead and turn there if you're in your Bibles, if you will. 1 Kings 8 is the dedication of the temple by Solomon in Jerusalem. This is the first time there's been a permanent structure as a temple in Jerusalem for the dedicated worship of Yahweh and the special manifestation of His presence. David assembled the materials but was not allowed to build the temple. His son Solomon would build it. And the temple gets dedicated in 1 Kings chapter 8, and Solomon gives this magnificent prayer where he prays for the people as he dedicates the temple. And I want you to look at some of the details in Solomon's prayer here. He's prayed for the people of Israel. He's prayed that God would hear their prayers. He's prayed for foreigners who would come and worship Yahweh, that God would listen to Gentiles' prayers as they come and worship Him. Because... Surely they will hear of God's great name and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. So, God, would you do for the Gentiles, for the foreigners, all that they ask? And then look down in verse 46. When they sin against you, Solomon prays. And this is the king, by the way, who is humbled before all of the people, acknowledging that there's a king higher than him, that that Yahweh is sovereign. And the king says in front of all the people, there is no man who does not sin. When they sin against you and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they take away them captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, if they take thought in the land where they've been made captive and they repent and they make supplication to you in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying, we have sinned and we've committed iniquity, we've acted wickedly. 
If they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies you have, uh, who have taken them captive, and they pray to you toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, the house which I have built for your name, then hear their prayer and their supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you, and make them objects of compassion before those who have taken them captive, that they may have compassion upon them. What a remarkable prayer. And Solomon's thoughts here go back long before the dedication of the temple. They go back to Moses and Moses' sermon over the people before they entered the land. Moses' sermon for the people before they entered the land is called the book of Deuteronomy. And in the book of Deuteronomy, you may remember, God promised blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And God speaks to the people through Moses and says, I know you will disobey. And so Solomon here is appealing to that very reality. And he's looking forward to that time of the exile and praying that that God would cause them to look to him in prayer and that he would hear them and forgive them when they confess their sins. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is doing that very thing. Daniel Daniel 9 is a fulfillment of 1 Kings 8. And this prayer of Daniel's is grounded in God's word. That is the ground of Daniel's prayer. It's grounded in the promises that God made through the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel's own contemporary. Um, By the way, Jeremiah 25 was probably uh, written in 605 at the first deportation. Jeremiah 29 was probably written in 597 at the second deportation. And in both of those uh, exile movements... Jeremiah is giving the assurance from Yahweh that this exile will only last 70 years. Daniel appeals in prayer to the very promises of God in his word. And if you think about it from a human perspective, Jews in Babylon under the reign of Belshazzar, how could they they imagine that the mighty Babylonian empire would come to an end and be judged at 70 years? That a threat as big and as powerful as Babylon would just go away. I mean, 70 years is kind of a short time for such a mighty empire to dissolve, one would think. Do you remember the 430 years of captivity in Egypt? That's how we got started. You mean like tomorrow Babylon's just going to go away? But the handwriting was on the wall. And God would keep his promises. And in the middle of the night... (laughs) An unlikely small force of arms breached the wall of this impenetrable fortress and ended the Babylonian Empire at a party. God promised. In fact, God promised through Isaiah in Isaiah 44, 28 that he would raise up a certain Cyrus to accomplish this very thing. And in Jeremiah 51, 11, God promised that it would come through the Medes. Well, How would Cyrus, a Persian, and this promise of conquering through the Medes happen? These two prophecies, disparate promises, by human calculation that would seem impossible or even a contradiction, actually came to pass just as God said right on time in the Medo-Persian Empire to bring about the fall of Babylon. So Daniel is appealing to God's very word as he prays. The third element of Daniel's prayer we'll see in this introduction is the disposition of Daniel's prayer. We see this in verse 3, look down at it. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. What was Daniel's attitude in this prayer? What was the posture of his heart? He says literally, I set my face to Edonai Elohim, that is, the Lord God. Uh, The Lord Edonai means master, and Elohim is the title for God, the creator. Daniel says, "I, I set my face toward him. What does this posture indicate? Uh, Intense devotion. He's giving close attention in prayer. This is undistracted prayer. This is fervent prayer. This is a prayer of a man whose thoughts are fixed on God. 
Think about your own prayer life. I don't know about yours. I, I think about how often I'm distracted in prayer. What would it be like to step into the throne room of an earthly sovereign and say, <clears throat> Oh, king, live forever. Oh, man, what am I going to have for lunch today? I mean, uh, excuse me. Oh, king, I'd like to ask you, what was that thing I was thinking of? Man, I've got a final next week. <laughs> we just wouldn't do that in the awe-inspiring presence of an earthly king, and yet how careless are we at times in prayer? And, and listen, I, I know the Holy Spirit fixes our prayers on the way up. We have that promise in Romans 8. We don't even know how to pray and the Holy Spirit, who knows the will of God, intercedes on our behalf with deep, wordish groans. That's not some mystery mysticism in your heart making noises in you. That's the Holy Spirit fixing our prayers on the way up to conform to the will of God the Father. I recognize that God is tender with us and merciful with us in our weakness. But I also think about Jesus' words to the disciples in the garden. Could you not pray one hour? My daughter has a, an assignment for one of her classes as a freshman in college this year, and the assignment is to pray an hour straight every day for the semester. It's been a great assignment, a, a life-changing one. And it's just been a, another reminder to me, along with this chapter, at how frequently my prayers are not, I set my face to Edonai Elohim in this kind of intense, undistracted devotion. And he says, I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications. The word for prayer here is intercession, a go-between. And supplications is a plea for mercy. That is, God, have mercy on me. That is, will you have compassion on our pitiable state? And notice what external things accompany this internal posture of prayer. Fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Fasting, of course, is going without food for a time. That requires preparation. It doesn't really count as fasting if you're not munching while you're praying. I'm not eating right now while I'm praying. I must be fasting and praying. No, the, the fasting here means a, a preparation of not having eaten for some time in preparation for prayer. And the idea there is that time with God, a seeking of the Lord, is, is better than food for me right now. And the idea behind sackcloth, the, 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 the clothing of the absolute destitute and impoverished, is that God is better than comfort. This would have been a sign, an outward sign of utter humiliation, a recognition of my spiritual poverty. And the idea of throwing ashes on the head was a sign of grief, mourning, deep sorrow. Here, I believe this is sin grief. And we'll see that in the content of Daniel's prayer in the coming weeks. The idea of fasting and sackcloth and ashes are, are piled together in various prayers throughout the Bible. You may, may remember Jonah chapter 3. The people of Nineveh fasted and wept and prayed in sackcloth and ashes. Why? Because Jonah, the reluctant prophet, who actually was a xenophobe, didn't like them. He was uh, racist and nationalistic and didn't want God to have mercy on those dirty, rotten Ninevites. And yet they heard the preaching of the reluctant prophet and they humbled themselves before the Lord. And the whole city is in sackcloth and, and weeping and turning from their sins. And the text says they believed in the Lord. And the king himself came out in utter humiliation and sackcloth and ashes. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. It's in there somewhere. There it is. It's on page 497. <laughs> if you happen to have the same... Bible as I do. Nehemiah chapter 1 describes a very familiar prayer, familiar sounding prayer, now that we just listened to Daniel's prayer. This is back in the land with the same urgency and a concern for the same spiritual state of God's people. 
Nehemiah 1 verse 4. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Yahweh, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept the commandments or statutes or ordinance which you commanded for your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell." They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. And a similar prayer occurs in Nehemiah 9 when they are back in the land. In Esther 4, we get a similar prayer from Mordecai when he learned of Haman's plot against the Jews. It was sackcloth and ashes. Job 2.12 describes Job's friends tearing their clothes and throwing dust on their own heads at the sight of Job's suffering. What are these external features put on display? An internal heart of desperation. These are desperate prayers. Prayers when God's people acutely feel their need. These are prayers of desperate times and dire straits. They are serious prayers. They are humble prayers. This kind of prayer acknowledges that we have no merit of our own to gain a hearing with the living God. We are, in fact, sinners and we only deserve condemnation. So, why is Daniel praying like this? I mean, think about it. You open up Jeremiah, you know, 70 years, I'm 81, 82, when did I come here? Okay, 66, 67 years. Man, it's got to be close. I, I don't know when the 70s started. If it started when I was deported in 605, man, it's right around the corner. What would you pray? What would you be thinking? Would you even pray at all? Maybe you would get a string and, 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 some, and some, a needle on the end of the thread and poke it through the little pieces of popcorn, make one of those popcorn, strand, popcorn strands that count down to Christmas break. Did you ever do that? Some sort of a number chart that you, you cross out and you go, it's almost summer vacation. If you were looking at Jeremiah's prophecy, you'd be counting down the years. And, and if, you, if you did pray, um, what would you pray for? Now that the exile was almost up, maybe that nice home in Jerusalem that you wanted to have? Uh, remember that favorite spot, that you, you hope the, the, the one with the view, you hope it's not taken? Maybe you pray for a good plot of land, some mature vineyards, some healthy olive groves, maybe some feral cattle ready to make steaks. But as we'll see in the coming weeks, Daniel's prayer is nothing of the sort. He doesn't look at Jeremiah's promise from God that 70 years would be the end of the exile and then you get to go back to the land. No, Daniel is grieved. He's grieved here under the promises of God over his sins and regarding the sins of God's people. His concern is most profoundly about the spiritual state of the nation the exiles, and the ones who remain in Jerusalem and Judea, and the ones scattered to the other nations. I believe Daniel was seriously concerned about the spiritual state of the nation in exile. Did they learn? Did the exile teach us what God intended for us to learn? Will we be faithful to Yahweh? How many times have we as a nation, Daniel would be thinking, turned away from the living God to worship sticks and stones and the gods of the nations. How we've worshiped idols in our hearts, as Ezekiel says, and turned away from the truth. How often have we defected from obedience to God's law, to that which would give life and joy? 
how often will we ruin ourselves? I can't prove this, but I suspect that Daniel was concerned about the spiritual state of the Babylonian exiles. Were there some who said, when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do? Or maybe what happens in Babylon stays in Babylon? I want to turn your attention to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 5, and we'll make our way forward in Jeremiah for just a little bit this evening. I think we need to capture a flavor of why the exile happened to begin with and what would happen during and after. Jeremiah 5, beginning in verse 7, Yahweh asks this rhetorical question through the prophet, Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me. And sworn by those who are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery. They trooped to the harlot's house. They were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish these, declares Yahweh? And on a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? Go up through her vine rows and destroy, but do not execute a complete destruction. Strip away her branches, for they are not Yahweh's. Sounds like branches cut off for unbelief, like Romans 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, declares Yahweh. They have lied about Yahweh. They've said, not he. Misfortune will not come on us. We will not see sword or famine. The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in them. Thus it will be done to them. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire and this people wood, and it will consume them. Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares Yahweh. It is an enduring nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. And he goes on to describe what Babylon would do. Look at verse 19. It shall come about when they say, why has Yahweh our God done all these things to us? Then you shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you will serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Look down at verse 30. Or verse 29. Shall I not punish these people, declares Yahweh? On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. Look at Jeremiah 6, 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it also. Turn again to Jeremiah 29, that great promise of the great plans that God has for them. Jeremiah 29 is actually a letter sent from Jeremiah to the Babylonian exiles. Notice this in verse 1. These are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon. Now look down at verse 15 of this letter. Because you have said, Yahweh has raised up prophets for us in Babylon... For thus says Yahweh concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, that is Jerusalem, your brothers who did not go with you into exile. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, behold, I am sending upon them the sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like split open figs that cannot be eaten due to rottenness. I will pursue them with the sword, famine, and pestilence. I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth a curse and a horror and a hissing, a reproach among all the nations where I've driven them, because they have not listened to my words, declares Yahweh, which I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets, but you did not listen, declares Yahweh. You therefore hear the word of Yahweh, all you exiles whom I have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, What is the message of this letter? 
There were people who, disobedient to Yahweh's word, fled to Egypt. None of them would come back alive. There were those who stayed disobedient to God's word in Judea and Jerusalem, and they would die by famine and the sword. And those who obeyed God and went with the Babylonian exile would be preserved. But in Babylon, some of the people there were listening to false prophets. Uh, Skip down to verse 23. Well, go to verse 22. Because of them, because of those who stayed in Jerusalem and disobeyed the Lord, because of them, a curse will be used by all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon, saying, May Yahweh make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. (laughs) In other words, uh, if you didn't like somebody, you'd say, May God make you like Zedekiah. And, And remember that the Babylonians came and killed his children before him, and then plucked out his eyes. So it was the last thing that he saw. A judgment of God against his disobedience. Verse 23, because they acted foolishly in Israel, they've committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. They have spoken words in my name falsely, which I did not command them. And I am he who knows, and I am a witness, declares Yahweh. Now he calls out two guys by name. Look at this in verse 24. To Shemaiah the Nehelamite you shall speak, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have sent letters in your own name to all the people in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, Yahweh has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest, to be overseer in the house of Yahweh, over every madman who prophesies, to put him in the stocks and the iron collar. Now then, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah who prophesies to you? For he sent us to Babylon saying, the exile will be long, build houses, live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Zephaniah the priest read this letter to Jeremiah the prophet. Then came the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah saying, send all the exiles saying, thus says Yahweh concerning Shemaiah the Nehalamite, Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, although I did not send him, and he's made you trust in a lie, therefore, thus says Yahweh, I am about to punish Shemaiah the Nehalamite and his descendants. He will not have anyone living among his people. He will not see the good that I'm about to do to my people, declares Yahweh, because he has preached rebellion against Yahweh. So you have in Babylon, amongst the exiles, at least one, and with a cohort in Jerusalem who are conspiring against Jeremiah, the true prophet's words, against God's very words to deceive the people. And apparently some in Babylonian exile believed that word. So again, what are the people doing even in exile? Disbelieving the word of God, hoping against hope that there's some other answer, some other pathway than God's good plan And so Daniel has every reason to believe that the spiritual state of the exiles is not all that it should be. Jeremiah 50 and 51 describe the destruction of Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 1, begins this statement. The word which Yahweh spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet, declare and proclaim among the nations, proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel is put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols have been shattered. A nation has come up against her out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror, and there will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast wander off. They have gone away. In those days, that is, at the days of the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire, declares Yahweh, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah as well. They will go along weeping as they go, and it will be Yahweh their God they will seek. They will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They will come that they may join themselves to Yahweh in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten." What happens? God's people in some measure repent and not just Babylonian exiles, but also other Jews who have been scattered to other nations and they come back to the land. 
This is a, a remarkable scene. What can we observe here in Daniel's prayer? Just the fact of Daniel's prayer. What do we learn about prayer? I, I think we see here a relationship between prayer and the Word of God. Daniel's prayer was grounded in God's Word. He picked up language from 1 Kings 8 and he banked on the promises in Jeremiah 25 and 29. Daniel is praying back to God the very words that God has given. And so there is a relationship between prayer and the word of God. There is also a relationship between prayer and the promises of God. Rather than taking those promises and making a countdown, Daniel saw that those promises came with the rejuvenation of Israel's spiritual fervency. That if God didn't bring it to pass they would be in trouble all over again. Daniel, in concern for the nation and recognizing that their return to the land had to be accompanied by repentance. Daniel prays for that very thing, a confession of sin, a confession of their infidelity as a nation. We see here also a relationship between prayer and the sovereignty of God. God made promises. He would keep his promises no one could violate or undo his promises. And yet God is going to use the means of a man to pray to bring about those ordained ends. God uses means. Some have said, well, if God is sovereign, why pray? Well, turn that question around just a little bit. If God is not sovereign... If God could not orchestrate the details of life, if God could not overrule the sinful plans of man and make them good, why pray? Why pray if God is not sovereign? The fact of a sovereign God means that we can plea to him. We can make appeal to him, to the Almighty, to Yahweh of hosts, to the one who has the king's heart like a channel of water in his hands. To the one who has made promises. God's people could pray in Babylonian captivity that somehow at the end of 70 years, Babylon would go away and the next empire would be kind to them and provide resources to them to get them back into the land just as God promised. And that God would even turn the hearts of his people to love him again. And there's something we ought to see here about prayer for Israel specifically. Think forward from the time of Daniel. We, we sort of get a recycling of Israel's apostasy over and over and again through their history. So that by the time Messiah himself comes, Israel is apostate and they murder Messiah. And Israel has been separated Think about Romans 11. They are the natural branches of that natural olive tree cut off for unbelief, lying there on the ground. There's a message to us Gentiles, don't despise the natural branches. Do you know one of the ways to not despise the natural branches lying there on the ground in unbelief is to pray for Israel. To have a heart for the very thing that God promised. That one day, Romans eleven twenty seven, 27, all Israel will be saved. God made a promise. Why not pray toward that end? This is very much in keeping with God's own heart. Uh, with Paul, excuse me, Paul, the apostle's own heart. He knew a day was coming. He, he encouraged Gentiles not to despise the natural branches. And listen to this benediction he gives at the end of the book of Galatians. Galatians 6.16. It's introduced by circumcision and uncircumcision all together in this new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, Paul says, peace be upon them. And he says, and also mercy be upon the Israel of God. Listen to that. Paul says, and mercy be upon the Israel of God. What did Paul know that Israel needed in their apostate state having rejected Messiah? <sighs> mercy. The compassion of God for sinners in a pitiable state, lying in unbelief, cut off from the natural olive tree, lying there on the ground. 
Could they be grafted again one day? Well, God said they would. Paul gives this blessing and benediction. It's in keeping with Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 125.5, peace be upon Israel. And Paul's own heart in Romans 9, 1, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart for them. And Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Paul's heartbeat and his prayers and his benediction were in keeping with God's own promises. Listen to Isaiah 62. Yahweh has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. That's an outstanding promise. Hasn't been fulfilled yet. But those who garner it will eat it and praise Yahweh, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, Yahweh has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him, and they will call him, they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. And you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken." We ought to pray that God would do this very thing that he has promised. Paul's prayer was in keeping with Isaiah's promise, just as Daniel's prayer was in keeping with Jeremiah's promise. When every disciple of Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, we are praying in keeping with Jesus' promise. It's good for us to pray along God's heart of promise. Let's pray together in closing. Our Father, we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have graciously given us a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And your spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And as children, heirs also, heirs of you and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. And so, Lord, we consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for our revealing as sons of God. And so we plead with you, O Lord, that we as aliens and strangers would abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against our souls. We know that with you a day is like a thousand years A thousand years like one day, and you are not slow about your promise, as some count slowness. But you are, in fact, patient toward us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And we know that your day will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works be burned up. And since all these things are be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? O Lord, make us so, looking for and hastening the coming of your day, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. And according to your promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, O God, cause us to look for these things, to be diligent, to be found by you in peace, spotless and blameless. Our only hope for any of these things is no merit of our own, not for our sakes, O Yahweh, but for your sake, for your glory, and by the blood of your own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.